The Southern Poverty Law Center has long been the think tank hatching the idea of vast right-wing conspiracies. SPLC is the source behind some of the most outrageous enemies lists being compiled by Homeland Security, fusion centers like the MIAC report, and emails and policy statements by the military. SPLC creates the boogeyman, writes the script, and Homeland passes it off to the police who are trained to associate political speech with a threat to their personal safety. And it's not just political speech. Southern Poverty Law Center is attacking religious freedom, calling it hate. This line of attack has been promulgated within the military. The free exercise religion of those in the military is being attacked as not just hateful, but conflated with the racism of the KKK. It's an interesting comparison for the SPLC to make since it got its start in the violent racist confrontations of the 60s. On May 20th, 1961, when a busload of black and white freedom riders arrived in Montgomery, Alabama, they were met with what Time Magazine described as an idiot club-swinging mob of about a hundred. In this picture, we see SPLC founder Morris Dees' first client. The man on the ground with the camera getting kicked by Klansmen? Uh, that's not Morris Dees' client. This is Dees' client. Dees didn't defend the Freedom Riders who were viciously attacked, bloodied, and had their bus set on fire. Dees defended the KKK thug, the ringleader. And he got him off, in spite of it being widely reported like this article in Life magazine. And Morris Dees got paid a lot of money, $5,000, which at the time was the median family income for a year. But this is what his bio on the SPLC website says. After launching a law practice in Montgomery in 1960, he won a series of groundbreaking civil rights cases. Maybe he should amend that to say that he won for the Klan, a leg-breaking case against civil rights activists. Morris Dees would have us believe that sometime after he got Klansman Claude Henley off, sometime after he cashed the check, that he decided that he would start suing the Klan for cash instead of defending the Klan for cash. Maybe it wasn't a moral epiphany, but a financial epiphany. He could make much more money doing direct mail fundraising to the public than he could suing. Criticisms of the SPLC from the left focus on how little it does other than fundraising, how much money it hoards for its endowment, and how much money it pays multimillionaire Morris Dees. Alexander Cockburn described Dees and the SPLC this way. Ever since 1971, U.S. Postal Service mailbags have bulged with Dees' fundraising letters, scaring dollars out of the pockets of trembling liberals aghast at his lurid depictions of hate-sodden America in dire need of legal confrontation by the SPLC. Cockburn wrote in 2009 how Dees and the SPLC were spinning the election of Barack Obama. What is the arch salesman of hate-mongering, Mr. Morris Dees of the Southern Poverty Law Center, doing now? He's saying that the election of a black president proves his point. Hate is on the rise. Send money. Without skipping a beat, the mail shot moguls who year after year make money selling the notion there's been a right resurgence out there in the hinterland with massed legions of haters have used the election of a black president to say that, yes, hate is on the rise in America, ready to burst apart at the seams, with millions of extremists primed to march down Main Street draped in Klan robes, a copy of Mein Kampf tucked under one arm and a Bible under the other. A high-profile case from 1977 shows the true nature of Morris Dees and the SPLC. After Dees and the SPLC hired Millard Farmer to defend five black men accused of murder, Farmer said Dees abruptly pulled out of the case, telling him that the case wasn't making any money for the SPLC. When Farmer refused to turn the case over to a public defender, Dees sued him for improperly spending SPLC funds. But Farmer went public, talking about how SPLC funds are really used. And he said of Dees, he's the Jim and Tammy Faye Baker of the civil rights movement, though I don't mean to malign Jim and Tammy Faye. The analogy couldn't be better. The SPLC is a perfect way for liberals to assuage their guilt buying indulgences from the church of Morris Dees. In 1996, USA Today called the SPLC the nation's richest civil rights organization with $68 million in the bank account. It's now grown to $224 million. It's easy to see how their endowment has soared. Alexander Cockburn pointed out that in 2007, they took in $45 million but only spent $21 million, spending only half of what they took in on their proclaimed mission and pocketing the rest. And part of the expenditure was the lavish salary of multimillionaire Morris Dees, who in 2010 was paid $350,000. How's that for Southern poverty? But ripping off guilty white liberals isn't what makes the SPLC dangerous. 
What makes them dangerous is when they partner with the government to intimidate dissenters, to threaten political speech, and to promote violence against those they demonize. Look at the notorious Mayak Fusion Center report, Missouri, 2009, where every supporter of limited constitutional government Every real political opponent of Obama was labeled as a possible terrorist, a person of interest, simply for having a bumper sticker supporting Ron Paul, Chuck Baldwin, or Bob Barr. Then there was the Huttery Militia case in Michigan. The government whipped the public into a panic about militias with the help of the media using SPLC talking points. Mark, did you know about this group? Oh, yeah. And they look to be a very small group with a very odd ideology, sort of a twist on the New World Order. Basically, like other militia groups, uh, what they really see happening to the world is a kind of takeover of the world by some sort of uh, one world government, a so-called New World Order. Their alleged plot to kill a police officer and then bomb the funeral procession afterward, the opening salvo allegedly of a war against the U.S. government. The case was thrown out by the judge, but you didn't hear much, if anything, about that. Or take Floyd Corkins, who shot up the offices of the Family Research Council because he bought into the fundraising propaganda of the SPLC that if you assert your religious liberty to resist being coerced into recognizing and subsidizing homosexual marriage, the SPLC will label you as a hate group. The real hate group is the SPLC, whose hate-mongering inspired Corkins to, quote, kill as many people as I could, then smear a Chick-fil-A sandwich on their face. And there have been multiple cases of the military repeating SPLC propaganda, labeling opposition to homosexual marriage mandates as hate, and the Founding Fathers as dangerous militia types. As we approach the one-year anniversary of the Boston bombing, we should remember how the SPLC was used to promote the idea that the bombing was done by their favorite boogeyman, patriots. It's conceivable uh, that it was uh, related to, uh, in particular, this thing, Patriots Day. Uh, it celebrates, of course, the American Revolutionary War, the first shots fired at Concord and Lexington. But in the world I cover, it is really, probably most importantly, the end of the debacle in Waco, Waco where 80 people died in a fire, uh, and two years later, payback uh, for the events in Waco, the bombing of the Oklahoma City building. Infowars exposed the Boston bombing as a false flag event designed to be blamed on patriots. Sir, why would a lot of speakers tell people in New York and stuff be calm moments before the bomb went off? Is this another false flag stage attack to take our civil liberties and promote homeland security by sticking their hands down on the camps on the streets? No. Next question. Why was people being told prior? 9 30 tomorrow morning will be the next brief. Two days later, the FBI postponed, then canceled a press conference where 100 reporters had gathered to hear about the suspects that CNN and other government spokesmen had been saying had been identified by the FBI. The FBI then waited another 24 hours before identifying two suspects that didn't fit the homegrown patriot terrorist narrative. Of course, we still haven't seen them even sitting the bags down. But we have seen the FBI murder a friend of the surviving suspect during questioning, shooting him six times and once in the back of the head, execution style. The Southern Poverty Law Center is a powerful propaganda tool of the government in the war of terror. But if we can defeat them in the info war, we can stop the shooting war for which the government is preparing.